Hello, and welcome to today's deep dive episode of Marathon Swim Stories, where we explore the power of the pod. I'm marathon swimmer and coach Shannon Keegan. The trials and tribulations of the coronavirus pandemic have divided some people. But this neighborhood swim pod found a safe way to come together, and in the process, they've learned to trust each other and themselves. They've pushed each other to swim further than they thought they could, but they also know when to give grace, making it easier to bear the weight of the stresses in their lives and get through another day. This was a nice reflection on the power and intimacy of my own swim pod, who I don't see nearly enough these days, and a good reminder how empowering it is to find your people You never know what you might try or how far you might go if you find the right company. I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to Marathon Swim Stories Deep Dive. Today we're going to talk about the power of the pod. And we'll just go around and I'll let the pod that we're talking to today introduce themselves. I see Pete on my top left. You want to start, Pete? (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Pete Rock. I am a fiction writer, and I teach at Reed College, and just love to swim. All right, Cindy, you're to my to the right of Pete on my screen. What do you? What do you? What's your story? Ah, <laughs> your short, um, your short story. <laughs> my short story. I'm a oncology nurse, and I do all sorts of different types of swimming. I kind of move around in what I like to do. So long distance. Short distance racing, cold water, ice swimming. Awesome. Emma? Hi, my name is Emma. Um, I'm a PhD student at Portland State University, and I, I, I'm in the biology department, but I do education research, so kind of studying how universities can support undergraduates um, in the sciences succeed and increase diversity there. And, um I have been like a lifelong pool swimmer and um, started open water swimming kind of on and off 10 years ago and we just really love it. So. Awesome. Scott? Yeah, my name's Scott. So I also kind of grew up competitively swimming in the pool. My dad, I think it was like 11, uh, took me to my first open water swim race. And ever since then, I was kind of hooked. After high school, I kind of took a break and 20 years later, he challenged me to a race. So here I am. <laughs> here you are. All right. So now we know who you are. Pete, Cindy, Emma, Scott, how did you find each other? <laughs> Where are you at? Anyway, people, people listen to Marathon Swim Stories all over the world. So we need some geography lesson here. Cindy, you <laughs> introduce where you are. <laughs> we are in Portland, Oregon. We are on the southeast side of Portland. We are, we all live very, very close to the Selwood Bridge. Um, And while we all met each other um, through kind of different swims before the pandemic, um, sometimes we swam in the pool together. Sometimes we swam in group swims with open water or with some of the other swim groups around Portland um, back in April when all the pools were closed and nobody was open water swimming, um, I received a text message from Scott asking me if I wanted to go back out into the river. And um, I felt at that time with the way our quarantine was described to us that we need to stay in our neighborhood. um, I let Scott know that I felt comfortable swimming with him because he was in my neighborhood and um, that I felt that we both could get there in a way that didn't disrupt any of the regulations and any of the um, suggestions. And uh, that's kind of where the first time that we met at the Selwood Bridge to swim in this new situation. It wasn't too long after that, probably the next swim, that Pete was invited along and um, probably a month or two after that, Emma joined us because we all live in the same neighborhood. So you guys didn't actually, prior to the pandemic, you weren't swimming together necessarily. We were swimming um, by happenstance. So maybe, Hmm. you know, we were all like, I was swimming with a group that Scott 
ended up being there with or Pete ended up being there with. There was a few times I would say that um, maybe three of the four of us were together in a larger group setting, mm. um, but not in this, not in the way that we're swimming right now. Mm-hmm. Anybody so. can correct me if I'm remembering <laughs> <or not. laughs> Yeah, we, we did swim a few open, like you're saying, we did swim a few open water swims together, but I think the main, t- main thing was that you, uh, Pete and I swam with Gretchen and that's kind of, what kind of brought us together and what brought Pete and I together before that was the river huggers. And that's what I found when I was looking for some open water training, when my dad challenged me to the race. So that kind of brought me into everything. And then a little bit after, you know, like you said, about a month after that's when I met Emma and she started swimming. And I found them, I was swimming with a, another friend, but we were having a lot of trouble like coordinating and she wasn't necessarily in the neighborhood. And I saw them getting out of the water one day and I ran up and I was like, please, <laughs> can I swim with you? <laughs> I love it. I love it. The joy of living in a city where there's other people swimming and open water <laughs> to be had. <laughs> um, okay, so we, so it's pandemic hits, there's restrictions on swimming. You um, you find a way to kind of come together. Um, where did you, what are you, what is it, what is it like? How are you, how are you feeling about this? Are you keeping distance, masks? Are you hugging each other? How's, how's this going in the beginning of the pandemic? You said April last year, right? April, 2020. Okay. I've never touched any of these people. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I want to, but <laughs> I it's think true we're yeah i think we're at different degrees and I, I think you know cindy i think is vaccinated now um we just you know we keep our distance pretty well mm-hmm. and uh you know swimming i think is relatively safe as as far as covid goes but um you know we don't share vehicles or anything like that we all you know try to figure out how to get places um and so yeah so we've been lucky that way mm-hmm yeah, it's even such that if, um, say, like I walk and I have a bag and I want to put it in someone's car, um, they'll step away from their car as I walk towards their car and put it in in the car. Or if we want to share something, we might like set it in the middle of the street so the other person can walk over and pick it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny um, to think like, I, I know when the pandemic is over, my other friends, I will go back to having physical contact with, but I was thinking like a couple of days ago, it would be so weird to hug any of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Their whole relationship is six feet apart at least. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting how like, yeah. Um, even, uh, I, well, I don't know what it's like for Cindy, like, oh, hold on a second. Um, it's interesting just like seeing because I remember the very beginning of the pandemic with the little pod that I swim with and just really missing being able to just like hey and we'd always just give each other a hug before we go swim like that's just what we did and now and now now it's like yeah we're so used to being so far apart I don't know that we'll go, go back to hugging it's, it's so interesting this is interesting the human humanity of this pandemic um so it's April so it's getting into warm what's water temps like then are we what's in current like is this is this a familiar place for you to for you guys to be swimming early pandemic uh 55 50 okay. uh, but you know our river bounces so it might be 55 one week and we get a little bit of a snap and it goes down to 52 51 and then kind of does this up and down for a while current is very dependent on the rain the snow melts um if they're releasing water so um yeah, it's, it's variable and that's kind of created a whole new learning experience for all of us, uh, reading gauges and reading um, different data that's put out on the river gauges as far as uh, discharge and turbidity and um, median flow and things like that. So going in, so going into pre-pandemic pod, what was your, like, if, would you read those gauges before swimming? I guess we'd go around the room with that. <laughs> or would you, or did you just swim somewhere else? Maybe. Pete, did you swim in the river in like April on a regular year? No, in a regular year, it probably would start in June. Mm. Um, and I mean, we'll probably get into the whole wetsuit question, but 
Um, I never wanted to swim in a wetsuit until the pool closed at Reed College. And then I was like, I have to swim and I have to be able to swim some distance. Um, so it was in April that I got the wetsuit. And then, um, and then, I mean, I think as, as we continued to swim year round, we could talk about it, it started to seem like maybe we can just swim the whole calendar. Maybe we could just stay with it. Um, because right now, 55, 52 sounds really warm. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in February. All relative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What was your experience prior to the pandemic, Scott? Were you swimming in the river year round or? Not at all. I mean, this is really like kind of my first real season actually swimming. I think the prior year was my real like personal first actual year of swimming open water than just being in the ocean growing up in California around Santa Cruz. So that, I think I swam up until November the year before, and this year made it a challenge to swim at least one day every month. And these three have definitely made that possible and helped me get in there and do it. So it's really, it's been, I think I've swam more this year open water than I ever have, even during the pandemic, just because of the three of them really being there and being motivational it's pretty awesome yeah and the, the fact that everyone's so diverse it's really another cool thing to see as well yeah so let's just do your background going into pre-pod emma where where would you have been swimming prior to the pandemic in april <laughs> i i started swimming um in summer 2019 in open water in portland um and then going into the winter 2019 to 2020 i was doing cold water swimming for the first time in my life and for me that looked like we were going to broughton beach in the columbia so long sandy beach we were swimming very close to the shore the water temp was about 42 um, and I was making it there about once every other week and swimming in the pool the rest of the time. And like nine minutes was my limit. <laughs> I never made it to 10. I was just <laughs> stuck at nine minutes and it was, you know, painful. And I felt like that was very, um, you know, like that was the limits of safety. And I felt like that was kind of a limit for me. So this has been a very different experience and definitely pushed a lot of my boundaries. Yeah. Um, but, but going in like in April, at that point, the river was, you know, 55. It was a natural point when the pools closed to just kind of start swimming a lot more frequently in the river. And that wasn't too crazy for me at that point. Right. Okay. Okay. Cause you had been swimming all winter. Got it. Right. Um, so yeah. So, so we, you meet each other, you guys start swimming, you got this variable karma to start reading gauges more, things like that. Um, how does, how is, how does it, how do we make connection and how do you stay in touch through the whole, through the whole of it? <laughs> well, we do have a uh, text thread that I'd say is probably my most active text thread <laughs> out of anybody. It's pretty surprising. Sometimes I'll look at it and there'll be 18 plus notifications and it's just from them. <laughs> and they're, they're usually pretty fun and entertaining texts. It's, it's not only, hey, we're gonna swim, you know, we're thinking about this. There's, you know, we've we've got some interesting things now. We've got a local seal that we call Winston that's it's a little celebrity now. So it's it's a fun conversation back and forth. <laughs> okay, so we so you're text coordinating and then how many how like when in the beginning, like how often were you swimming and how has that changed over time? I think in the beginning, maybe we were swimming two to three days a week um, based on coordinating our schedules. Mm -hmm. And none of us really work uh, traditional jobs Tradi in, traditional that, yeah. <laughs> in that um, we have to be in the water at 6 a.m. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, uh, I think it's a luxury to actually have some swims that are later in the morning, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, maybe we'll throw in a three after three in the afternoon swim. So it's not always super consistent. Although I think Pete would love it a little bit more consistently Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but, um, and then, uh, as the summer went on, it was pretty much every day, um, for those of us who, who can make it every day. And then as it got colder again, we're kind of back to the three to four days a week. And I think each month, somebody different, pushes kind of how often we're going so usually not me 
I need to be the <laughs> one that's least motivated. I can't take the cold, especially, I mean, I probably have the least cold resistance. Every time we get in, I look at Cindy and Emma and just think, God, they're crazy. I can't believe they're swimming without a wetsuit. And it's still every, you know, every time it will get colder, colder, colder. It'll be cold. Out, it'll be windy out. It'll be raining. And it's like, oh man, you guys are savages. <laughs> <laughs> so um did you did you ever take your wetsuit off scott <laughs> over I've, the tried, summer? I've i mean i've tried a few times i got a, a sh- smaller one millimeter just top and i've tried to do some combos but pretty much i think my my limit unless i'm actually swimming pretty hard is probably in the mid to upper 60s and where i start to need a wetsuit which eh, we'll see i'm i'm trying to do more but so yeah, in the summer you took your wetsuit off. Yeah, yeah. And then you were so you did you come in, Pete, when you came into the pod, were you a wet wetsuit wearer? Have you has that changed at all for you? Uh I, I definitely I hate wetsuits, um, but I wear them. I think Scott is not probably the the least tolerant to cold. He's definitely the least tolerant. Um, but I think, I think my limit is closer to like 60 high fifties and then it's like distance. Like I, I think, you know, now we're in a, in a moment where I probably could swim longer or stay in longer than Cindy or Emma, because I'm in a wetsuit. So that's always sort of a trade-off. Um, but I think maybe May I, I got the suit off and then kind of end of October, I had to get back in the suit again. Um, and it's like relearning how to swim because it's a much different kind of swimming. Uh, but yeah, who knows? I think aspirationally, we think, um, Scott and I think maybe someday we'll be able to be like Cindy and Emma, which is one <laughs> reason we swim with them. But the truth is they're just stronger than we are. It's like, it's not close. Um, it's, and it's not really that competitive, but there is a lot of teasing and a lot of carrying on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're the quote unquote penguins because we're in our black little tuxedos keeping warm and they're the yetis. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, um, okay. My, my favorite Scott story is the first time this winter that he got in after the temperature really, really dropped and he tried to layer up multiple the neoprene layers. <laughs> and then he was, he's usually the fastest among us. Um, and all of a sudden he was behind me and I was like, what's going on? He, he literally couldn't move. <laughs> I had probably about s- six millimeters of wetsuit on. Just like, uh, I felt like the kid in a Christmas story, just a starfish. I was like, oh my God, I can't go anywhere. I feel so constricted. <laughs> it was a little, a little nerve wracking. <laughs> but thankfully I have the three of them to help and everybody's been you know throughout the whole thing everyone's really aware of each other and you know like Cindy said we've been paying attention to the gauges this that and the other but really everybody's paid attention to themselves and each other as well I think that's been more important it, that we're really paying attention to each other and both ourselves and how we're feeling both before swims during swims and after swims you know it's pretty important with the safety of everybody, you know, Cindy working at the hospital, Emma at school and Pete at, at school teaching as well. You know, it's, it safety is a priority both out of the water and in the water. Yeah, for sure. So let's get into that a little bit more. How did, when did you start feeling, I guess, so you, you knew each other prior to, and you're just, and then you start getting together more frequently. Like, how do you kind of build that, like that trust with each other so that you so that you feel safe? I mean, I'd say that the open water swimming, just the fact that we kind of had swim, done some swims together. I mean, well, maybe not Emma so much, but like doing, starting to do those together, like you really do build confidence in each other because you realize how risky it can be at at some times, especially this winter when we swam together. It's been pretty crazy and we've been literally swimming dead in place or going backwards, depending on where we pick the eddy. It's pretty intense. So tell, tell us about a crazy day. <laughs> well, I, for, I forget the exact, I think it was late December and we had quite a few days of really, really heavy rain and the river had risen. I mean, I think a good seven feet plus since where it was. Wow. And we got in and we're looking at like, man, should we even swim? It's pretty, 
pretty dark. It's pretty swirly. There's quite a bit of eddies. And it's like, well, we can try. And if we, if we can't go anywhere, we don't do anything, then we just get out. You know, there's no reservations. We'll just see what happens and take it as is. Cause at least we're trying, you know, that's why one of the reasons why we do is just to see what we can do. And we got in and barely like I go in and take a few hard strokes. I'd say probably seven or eight hard strokes and look up to try and gauge see where I am and I'm backwards from where I thought I would be and look at everybody like oh my gosh like we're going nowhere we're going backwards so trying and then swimming almost like literally a few feet off the shore to actually make it somewhere where you can almost hands touch the ground Mm -hmm. and then someone else can try and tell a little story about swimming around the tree maybe (laughs) I know that was really fun (laughs) around the tree somebody (laughs) it's kind of it's hard to know like the legends of our pod and the things that become really important to us are probably not interesting to anyone else but there's one little tree which is between the boat ramp where we start and the bridge and the bridge is maybe 50 yards upstream and there were there definitely a period of time there where we never could reach the bridge and then when we got to the bridge and usually in the summer there's a, a big boat called the Queen of Seattle, which is about a mile upstream. And that would be, our usual swim would be about two miles. But just getting to the bridge became impossible. And then there's this little tree, which we really identify with because half the time it's underwater and it sticks up about 10 feet, but it just hangs on and hangs on. And we started just trying to reach the tree. And then the water got so high that we could swim between the tree and the shore. And it's all, its branches are all covered in wrappers and trash and we're kicking it it looks like maybe a beaver or something trying to take it down at some point but so like a lot of discussion of what the tree is doing whether we can reach the tree which side of the tree we're swimming on um it's like we we entertain ourselves so magnificently around these kinds of questions and the tree the sea lion they're really important um bench posts for us benchmarks yeah and it's that- really to emphasize that this tree is literally 15 feet away from where we get in the water and the amount of time this winter that we've spent thinking about can we get by the tree <laughs> upstream is, is crazy to get 15 feet up the river got it and i wanted to add to that story i think one of the things that just has slowly developed as far as our uh, understanding how we each work and what we're all doing um you know Pete and Scott both swim faster than Emma and I, and then you add in their wetsuit and then they get even faster. And so Emma and I will often watch Pete get in first so we can see how fast the water's moving. Um, And Emma and I will swim very similar to the same speed. So then she and I will get in, we'll swim next to each other. And on some of these days where the current was running so fast, without ever talking about it, without ever having any kind of pre-discussion of how we would manage this. Um, Scott peels back, gets in front of me so that I can drag off him and make distance that I could have never made on my own. We never talked about it. He just like came on this on his own, got in front of me. I knew exactly what he wanted me to do. And then he just pulled me forward. Pete did the same to Emma. And it was when I thought about it after the fact, I thought about what kind of um, just insight we had for each other and what we needed at that moment to like get that goal of getting past the bridge Mm. and um that to me really symbolizes like how we work together is this like kind of unknowing what each other needs at specific moments not just in the water but out of the water um to get us moving forward and moving past these days that feel like we're stuck um, in this endless current that we can't make progress in. And I mean, I really feel like that's what this pod is for me. It's like how I can get through each day to get to the next day to eventually make my way upstream in this pandemic. Good. I wrote that exact story down in, in my notes. <laughs> Just like <laughs> the, the moment where, you know, we spent, Cindy and I spent two or three, I don't know, swims in a row, not making it to the bridge and watching Pete and Scott, because if you can get back to, past the bridge, you can swim a little further because the bridge is the narrowest part mm. of the river. So the, okay. the water's fast, it's there. And, you know, we'd see Pete and Scott go ahead and just be like, why we're swimming in place and, and they're actually making distance. And the moment they come back and we d- dragged off them was really, really cool. 
that that is cool I'm, try, I'm trying to envision like I get, so is that the boat ramp where the portland bridge swim starts the solid yeah it's very close it, it's oh yeah it's maybe 100 yards upstream of that okay yeah. Just for yeah. for those, if anybody ever wants to do the Portland Bridge swim from Selwood to St. John, that's this is the, the landmark that we're talking about. Um, I was I'm just trying to think how you how how do you get to the spot though where you can I guess know somebody so well? Do so you think it just happens over time? Is that like how you put yourself out there? I don't know. <laughs> um, for me, I think it was uh, you know not if people know a little bit about my story in the past I've been more of a kind of put myself or ended up in the role of a leader um in the swim community in Portland um and when the pandemic hit and when nursing like really had to become my main focus I had to step back from that and um I think when I started joining these guys swimming I was no longer um I didn't put myself in the role of the leader. I really wanted to step back from that. And I felt like instead of being a role, you know, a leader role, I was a soul. I got to truly just be who I was. And there was a sense that these people were very present to me. Um, I could really um, in small doses, uh, let them know what was happening in my life and they never had judgment and they never were pushing advice or um, anything like that. They just let me daily um, be who I was in all of my different roles as a spouse and a nurse and, um, and sometimes a very frustrated swim leader who couldn't lead a community anymore. Um, they let me quit swimming, oh, probably like five times. <laughs> I was, I was like, I am done. I'm not doing this. And they, they said, okay, that's fine. We, you know, if that's what you need, we support you. This is where we're going to be. We're always going to let you know where we're at. You're always welcome to come back or if you want to paddle for us or if you just want to, you know, stop by and watch us swim, whatever. Like, like it didn't matter if I wasn't going to swim or was going to swim. Like, they were always still there. Um, and so I think to me, that's, that's how it happened for me. Also just a huge amount of swimming. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the nice things for me about swimming is there's not a lot of talking. Um, and so, <laughs> I mean, and sometimes the more you talk to someone, the less well you know them. But when you do something with, with another person, you do get to know them. And we just swam for hours and hours and hours and hours together. Sometimes a little bit of small talk here or there from a distance. Um, and so I think that was a big part of it. We just have spent so much. I mean, these are the people I've spent probably the most time with in this year that aren't my family. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and most of that has been silent time trying to get around a tree or trying to get to a bridge. Um, and I think also I would say listening to Cindy talk as much as she would say that she was not the leader, like Cindy has the most experience, certainly of all of us swimming in general, swimming in this river. And one of the great things for us is swimming in the same spot for this period of time, which might seem boring, but it changes so much mm -hmm. over the season. And that builds up confidence too. Um, that we, we know the conditions, we know how it's been before, we know where to get out. Um, and I think Cindy also has the most crazy ideas of variations we might do. She's like simultaneously the safest among us and the most dangerous um, in terms of the ideas she concocts. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to add to that, Emma or Scott? I definitely have to agree with that. It's I'm usually the first person saying maybe we should turn around and Cindy's always like a little bit further, a little bit further. And it's usually because I'm, I have an older brother who's eight months older than me and it's always like, okay, let's do it. And I would have, you know, followed my older brother into pretty much anything when I was younger. I feel kind of the same thing because she is, you know, despite what she does say too, she is, we do rely on her with, for her wisdom and, you know, just kind of trusting her, okay, a little bit further seems okay. But knowing at certain points too, when I do need to turn around, like there was one swim when we were trying to swim to Milwaukee from Selwood and I was just getting pretty darn cold. And I knew that I needed to turn around despite being able to see, like it was probably 
500 yards away. So it would have added an extra thousand yards. And I just knew I needed to turn around and on the way back. We were probably a couple hundred yards away and I cramped in both legs and b- feel like I barely made it back and just knew that I, that one time I did have to trust myself despite knowing, you know, that a little Sydney bit said more. a little bit farther. Just a little bit more. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so we do have like a lot of personal responsibility while also looking to Cindy for some guidance and um, advice. And I, I think like jumping back to your question about like, how do we establish that safety? We don't really talk about it that much anymore, but we did talk about it um, more when we started swimming as a pod. And because we have, we're kind of in pairs, right? Cindy and I can swim together. Pete and Scott can swim ahead, but they're always very, very good at, you know, circling back for us, checking in on us. Um, one thing I really appreciate, especially when I'm not in a wetsuit and swimming with people who are, um, especially Pete and I swim together a lot, um, just like he's constantly checking on me or, you know, I'm the one in charge of when we turn around. Um, and I just really appreciate that kind of sense of safety and trust. Did we lose Shannon? She's, oh, she's muted. Sorry, I'm talking on mute, you know, (laughs) (laughs) sorry. I said, what's cropping up for me is the, the intimacy of swimming with a small group which is some, I guess, as somebody who lives in a more rural area where there's just less people inclined to go swimming, um, like kind of, we kind of have that intimacy with our little group, but it, it's interesting to me, like just from the social study perspective of like living in a larger city and trying to find that pod because there's open water groups like all over the place, right? <laughs> That's how I envision it, right? But there's, there's a bunch of different groups, um, but, but, but I love that the, I guess the, that the pandemic brought you to like this more intimate place that you can find this like comfort with each other. Um, the thing I was going to ask, I'm wondering, Cindy, cause this is, this is something that I find in myself with my little pot of people. Um, do you, do you think that you would be the one saying, oh, just a little bit more? How am I trying to ask this question? Like I find my, I, I have more of a comfort to say, hey, let's to push myself a little further and try to bring a group along when you've got, you know, that right group of people versus if you were just, but well, it's not like you're going to be by yourself or if it's just one other person. Like, do you, do you feel like that you get, like, there's this confidence you get to just to try a little bit more, push a little bit more. Like it's just because you've got this group with you. Um, I, well, I'll explain it in a way that probably very poignant this year. Um, you know, half of this year I swam blind, blind, or at least it felt I swam blind. Mm-hmm. Starting in um, end of May, June, I started to get out of the water and feel like I had a lot of debris in one of my eyes. It felt like I like could not get whatever irritation it was out of it. Um, and I already have some vision limitations. Everybody who swims with me knows that like, I'll, they'll be like, look at that bird. And I'll be like that white dot. But this was, this was progressing in a way that every time I got out of the water, my eye was very uncomfortable. Um, and as the summer went on, the pain that I was experiencing in my right eye was causing my left eye to work very hard. And so my both, my complete vision was really declining. And it got to the point where I was swimming by feel most times off of people's kick um, and the feel of the water around me of where they were. Would I have done that with any other swimmers? No. And at the same time, I think um, whether they realized it or not, they were also helping to guide me and they were being more cognizant of placing themselves so that I could um, use them to get myself through a swim. Um, so, you know, I would say, yeah, I mean, what you're asking me is like, without them, I probably would not have attempted to be swimming in that type of a, um, impairment without, without these guys. Well, yeah. I mean, and I guess I was even thinking just impairment aside, like this, the empowerment you feel of just having, you know, the people that you trust around you to do a little bit more than maybe like, maybe like then your goal, like when you, when you get in, you know, maybe your goal is just to get in. Right. But then 
but then you get in and you feel pretty good and you're like, oh, well, let's, you know, try to get to the tree <laughs> or, or the, like, you know, like that just, um, I think I'm just trying to get to like that, you know, like that empowerment, like how can we relate to other people, how they should find their people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this, this is kind of something that we've talked about in our, in our group before, um, but the conditions we're swimming in are, are, uh, such that like I would feel very uncomfortable swimming with other even other experienced swimmers who would, might come in and want to swim with us just because the turbidity the cold the like we can't get out we, we have one entry point um and so you know we're swimming and it's not like we can get out of the water anytime we start feeling too cold um so just like there's a lot of you know the place and you know the conditions and you know what the people around you can do and I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable swimming with new people at this very moment in time in the conditions that we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, I know when I've swam with other larger groups of swimmers or different groups of swimmers prior to this, I usually kind of have my head on a swivel too and kind of looking at other people and kind of watching because I usually am the one in a wetsuit too and realize I can, you know, if anything, I might have a little bit more ability or warmth. And I don't find myself doing it quite as much. I still pay attention to them, but at, at, I don't feel like I have to have my head on a swivel. And to Cindy's comment earlier, it's usually me who's looking at the birds. That's why my head's usually on a swivel. I'm like, oh, do you see that bald eagle? Oh, do you see the osprey? And they're usually like, no, we're swimming. What are you doing? Um. I was trying to figure out how to get into Pete, you'd mentioned something about just the consistency of, you know, going to the same spot and like how, you know, like prior to the pandemic, we would all, I mean, in, in every instant, you like, you make plans, you go here, you go there and, you know, all these things that we could do, but how it's interesting to me, like the relationship you're able to build with your own water, waterfront. Does anybody want to speak to that? I guess so. I mean, it's also kind of related. It's sort of self-selecting. Like, it's not as if we gathered together people who didn't swim already. Um, And it was kind of people in the neighborhood. Also, as Cindy said before, our schedules are such that we can swim at a time when even if other people want to join us, we can make it really inconvenient for them. And so it's, but part of it is just proximity for all of us, like even though we have unconventional schedules, like I have kids, like I have a dog, I have classes I need to teach. Um, and when I when my kids were little, I always had this rule that any any kind of activity they had where actually the traveling to and from it was longer than the activity, that was a problem. And it's sort of, it's so nice to be there in 10 minutes and to be able to swim. So even if it weren't pandemic, it would be hard for me to to travel very often, very far. So it's been nice in that it keeps people close, um, these people close. Uh, But I guess, yeah, just, um, I I don't think until maybe October, I don't know if anyone has really swum in Selwood in the winter before, because it's, in terms of the current and everything else, like Rotten Beach is just easier. It's easier to get out. Um, But I think, it's sort of like things getting colder. If you're doing it a couple of times a week, you're seeing how it changes. You're saying, oh, I could still do this. I could still do this. But that early January, when we were swimming in place for those weeks, that was sort of, the, I think, the place where, or Emma and I had like a week ago, we had a swim where it was about 42 and snowing and the current surprised us. I guess sometimes you think maybe we won't make it, but this week has been good. So we'll see. having the confidence to bet just to just to go give it a shot just see and oftentimes we'll look at the the gauges after the swim to kind of be like oh we just swam in <laughs> 120,000 you know cfs like have we done that before is that a new pr for us or you know just kind of like matching the you know the tide with with the flow and just kind of just getting a feel after the fact that like okay, we did that. And then if we look at those conditions the next day, we can kind of compare and be like, okay, we crossed the river at this flow. So now we, we know that we can do it again. So. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So when do you go from checking all the gauges and everything ahead of time to checking them after the time? <laughs> I guess it comes from the comfort. I think we go into yeah. the same place, right? <clears throat> and there's absolutely things that we would never attempt on one day that we've attempted just two days before based mm-hmm. on those conditions. So, I mean, um, crossing the river where we do, I don't do that in the summer even though the flow is okay. Cause we just don't have in the winter, we just don't have the boat traffic so we can mm. do that. Yeah. Um, and we don't have the crewing boats out. Um, and so we've got a few selective days and we can actually cross over and then go under the bridge and then cross back. And, um, but that's not a everyday thing. It's really based on so many factors. So. Mm-hmm. That, that is also nice too, that there is, you know, like it is the same place, but we've had so much variability with the conditions and everything and going left, right, across, upstream, downstream, that it's really been so much fun to have that spot and learn it so well in all its variable conditions. And add, like you were saying, adds to the comfortability with these people as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then just when you think you have it figured out, there's giant sea lions, you know, it's like, it's, it's never, it, there's always something new. <laughs> yeah. Tell us only one me. sea lion. We like to pretend that there's only one sea lion in the entire river. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to tell me about where, when you met Winston? <laughs> I think Winston started coming out um, maybe December when the water got, cold and and we were pretty nervous the first time I'm just gonna sound silly for all the summer system with sea lions all the time but we were pretty scared <laughs> um we were like okay we're gonna swim in the opposite direction of course the, the sea lion can swim much faster than us so it doesn't matter but every time we've gotten in so far the, the sea lion pretty much just disappears there was one time when we did accidentally spot two sea lions in the same field of vision and you know that kind of burst their bubble for a bit but usually just one more than just one. <laughs> no, no, just one. Just Winston. <clears throat> we have a duck at our at our local lake that we last year he was there all winter. It's called Herman. We called him Herman. <laughs> and he would always just be there just checking out the, the boat ramp all by himself. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there was only one. <laughs> Pretty sure there was. But anyway. Um I wanted to go into a little bit of um how do you um push each other graciously? <laughs> 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 to do something maybe I don't know it, distance wise cold wise I don't know how do you graciously push each other usually in the middle of the swim <laughs> change the plan <laughs> do what you're not point. supposed to do <laughs> so, I know we said we were going out for 15 minutes but I think we can make it 25 <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> a lot of it does have to do with time and so even the longer swims in the summer, I mean, I was thinking about marathon swim stories and, and you know, I think the furthest that I swam this year was six miles. And, but then there were weeks when I was swimming almost 20 miles a week, um, but it was a lot of two mile increments sometimes. But for me to like eke out two and a half hours of my day, sometimes really hard. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of times it's a question of distance, but it's also a question of time. It's gotten colder. It's of course much more pronounced, but for us to swim to Milwaukee or to swim from Milwaukee down to Lake Oswego, um, usually takes a little bit more foresight to plan mm-hmm. ahead. So we, I mean, we definitely fell into sort of a regular about an hour, hour and a half is what we could do and everyone could get back to whatever they need to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think too, that, um, we're very different swimmers in terms of what we're after. Um, I, um, I don't know. I mean, I think Cindy at different times has an idea of a big swim that she has in the future that she's working toward in some way, um, that we might not, I I don't know. So it's sort of everyone is swimming together, but also swimming with their own sense of, you know, what, what they want to get out of it or what they're swimming toward in the future. So being aware, um, in some ways it didn't work out, but even I think Cindy was doing a qualifier for Loch Ness and we were trying to help her by swimming for like an hour and a half with her as she was swimming for six hours or something. So that sort of, of questions of time come up often too. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's it's a constant <laughs> time. <laughs> you, know, you know, Shannon, sometimes um like especially last spring, I'd throw on paddles so that I could, you know, swim a little bit faster and right up close next to the guys. And um, without letting them know, I would every 50 strokes just turn it on as hard as I could. And I would see them slide back and then pull forward. And then I do, you know, 50 to 100 strokes, you know, normal speed. And then I'd speed up again. And uh, we'd get out and they'd be like, that was awesome. That was freaking cool. <laughs> and it was, again, it was unplanned, but it was like some different type of pushing. Um, you know, like these guys have such incredible potential. They, I mean, like they, like they have it in them to do some like incredible swims. Um, and I think that's probably where my experience just has the greatest role in like seeing like, okay, I trained this way and I was able to do it. So like, you guys are so ready to do this. Emma, you know, she did a bridge swim and she and I talked about it um, before she went and swam it this summer and like her training compared to her previous training for the bridge swim. And I just talked about how I thought that um, how it would go and where I thought she might have some challenges, but there was never a question in my mind that she was going to finish it and, and have a great swim. And I think just that little bit of background uh, of my experiences and um, the training I'd done and how I think that that means that they're going to have a, a, you know, amazing swim. I think that's just enough to push them to, to try things. Mm -hmm. It's good to have that. I'm, to I'm toying around with a new um, tagline for, <laughs> for, um, I guess, intrepid water, but marathon, sten marathon swim stories being the extension of that, but it's like empowering people to start <laughs> because that's really where it begins is you just need to be informed and have the right community and the knowledge to to try something big and scary um or was, go ahead it, it was really helpful to have cindy's advice for that because i i did train my first bridge swim so 12 it was 11 to 12 miles um and previously the longest swim i had done was six miles and I trained so hard the first time I did it. And then the second time, which was last summer, a friend said, Hey, do you want to do this in a week? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I haven't, you know, we've been swimming a lot, but I haven't like really thought about it. And to have Cindy say like, Oh, you can do this was, was so helpful. And, um, I think that's our goal for Pete and Scott for this summer at the minimum. Oh, Pete's looking a little, <laughs> a little hesitant <laughs> for the minimum to get them to do the Portland bridge swim, uh, route. So. Yeah. What do you think about I'd, that? I'd like to do that as well. I mean, that's one of my goals for sure is I was supposed to do one of the legs last year and because of COVID, obviously that got canceled, but pretty much, I mean, both Cindy and I think, I believe Emma and Pete have been on all of my longest swims. I mean, my longest swim prior to this was the Alcatraz swim when I was 16 years old. So you know, that's a little over a mile. And then we were swimming average, you know, two miles a day plus during the summer, sometimes three miles every day or every other day. And, you know, we eventually, I eventually did, what was it? I think what's the around Ross Island? It's like three or six miles. Five. Five. That's right. So that's, you know, because of her confidence and telling her leadership and as well as Cindy, Cindy or uh, Emma and Pete also having done it before I'm like, okay, I know I swim with them. I, I should be able to do it too. And having that confidence from them really helps out in all the experience. Mm -hmm. To just open you up to the possibility of. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is always obviously some hesitation and feeling scared, but having them beside me and swimming usually with them on my long swims and stuff that I've never done before really helps. Mm -hmm. Pete, what do you think about swimming the, the route of the Portland Bridge swim route this year? Solid to St. John. <laughs> Oh, it's something that I would like to do. Um, and I think I can do it also. I've swam legs a bit before. And that seemed when I swam those legs, it was some of the longer swims that I'd done. But now, I mean, swimming from Selwood down to Omsi seems really short to me, especially downstream. So I think I could do it. I guess the reason I was making a face is I just I, I just don't like the idea of goals. Um, I don't like the idea of having goals for my I don't put that kind of pressure on my swimming. I would like to swim that though. And uh and I think if I were, I think I could have swum at the summer to like 
considering how many miles I was swimming every week. Mm -hmm. um, it just didn't work out schedule wise. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's always a negotiation to get that much time or to get other people committed in my household, in my particular swim dreams. Um, <laughs> although they're supportive. Um, yes, I, I, I can appreciate that. <laughs> it doesn't have to worry about setting goals. I do it for them. <laughs> a goal setter an appointed gold setter in your pod that's perfect <laughs> makes it easier yeah let's talk about um intentionally intimate i'm just kind of toying around with this idea there was something pete said about strategically scheduling so others couldn't attend so how do you yeah, I guess say intentionally intimate <laughs> and, and like, and not let, like, cause I even was thinking like, oh, I should, yeah, I'd love to come up and swim the Portland Bridge swim route with you guys where you're like, no, 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 we're, we're just us. <laughs> like, even if I was like, no, I'll keep my six feet. <laughs> Cindy knows a little bit of how I swim, but not really. <laughs> so how do you, I don't know, when you find the people and you stick with it, like, how do you just kind of stay, I don't know. How do you, you know, like the, there's like this desire in the world to grow, 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 but there's a time when we need to just be, right? It, it's both true and a little bit of a joke. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it's more true during the winter when we're swimming in more technical conditions. Over the summer, we definitely, there were other people who would occasionally join us. We'd swim with other people occasionally keeping keeping distance, but we still mostly swim with us just because there's like a convenience factor of, of mm -hmm. having, you know, the, the schedule, I guess. Sad. I kind of had a panic attack when I thought things would open up that I would lose what we had. So I think that that was a fear of mine. Um, and I know a couple times when we've had other people join us this winter, I might have sent out a text message before the swim that just said, Hey, remember, I know we're excited about having somebody new join us, but remember our distance and just be thoughtful to check back with each other and just kind of reminding because it does change a little bit of the personality of the group. When we add one more swimmer, we might be more willing to chase a new swimmer with a little bit of, you know, fun competition or, um, but I don't know, we, I mean, it's not that we don't invite people. Well, I guess we don't invite people. But <laughs> it's not that we're not willing to have people join us if they said, hey, I wanted to swim. I see you guys swam at this time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're just very, we're, we're just very cautious because of our jobs and because of our family situations. And um, we don't want to risk, um, you know, um, one of the four of us getting sick and then, you know, then our group is all, you know, at risk. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty apparent that swimming is a lot to all of us and to lose that because of, you know, just not caring is, or, you know, allowing, ne not necessarily allowing somebody else to come in, but, you know, adding unnecessary risk, I think is just not, not what we're necessarily into you know i mean yes we're putting because we're already putting the the un some somewhat would say unnecessary risk just getting in the river during this winter and you know so i think adding even more is just compounding that not very smart i would i just add them I in there definitely are people we like who occasionally will swim with us but um it's not that exclusionary and at the same time, I think I'm not an expert on numbers or safety, but I don't like swimming with more than, you know, three other people. I don't like big groups and I don't like big groups at all. I don't even like people, but, you know, <laughs> I think it's like, I wouldn't swim by myself in the river. And I also wouldn't, I don't like swimming with like six people. It's just too much to keep track of. I don't, I feel like I can keep track of three other people pretty easily, especially if we're paired up. It just makes sense. Um, and there are other people who have, you know, their own pods, which is great. But when, you know, whenever anyone asks me about it, I'm just like, these three people are really nice to me, but they don't like other people. Like, <laughs> they, like, they don't want to, like, they're, they're kind of antisocial. Like, I'm uncomfortable asking. And so <laughs> just limit it that way. Yeah, I didn't know you were telling other people that, beat. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the, the thought that safety in numbers is a little misleading. I feel like sometimes when you get these bigger groups that um, 
some people are just following along and they hand over their safety to the leader of the group or to um, even to paddlers. And, and I, I've seen some groups of 10 get strung out in ways that they think they're still safe, but there's no way that one of those swimmers could, um, you know, utilize any of the other group to, to help them understand the conditions or the safety. I mean, you, you have to understand that like when one of us stops swimming and goes from, you know, vertical to horizontal, it's like almost immediate, like synchronized swimming. Bloop, we all do it. It's like, we're so in and like aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just kind of look at people's eyes and just, you know, see a signal and Emma and I know that we're turning around and that's like, that's it. Like, and I just don't know that we would have that same thing if our group expanded, you know, three or four more swimmers. Mm -hmm. so. and Cindy and I can turn around and even if Pete and Scott are swimming ahead we know that they'll turn around and, and chase us you know within 30 seconds if we're ready to get out we we know that they're gonna probably turn around soon too and if they don't we also know that they're okay on their own yeah awesome to kind of close it out think of um one or two things that were your I guess that that you've learned about yourself through your experiences of your kind of growing your intimacy with your pod over the last year? Who's going to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, you're the only one off mute. So you're on the spot. Oh, I am. Okay. Um, well, I think I, I've already stated for me that I feel like I'm a soul, not a role with these guys. Um, and to me, that was a very, uh, huge lesson. Um, and I just, I feel like I, I have a very, I've entered a very compassionate state of swimming, um, with these people, uh, that is so much more than just getting in yardage or being in for 30 minutes. So I think that to me has been, um, the most powerful aspect of this year for me. going next I think um, I've I've learned um I mean coming into this winter I had so many limits that I thought I had and it, it's cliche you know sounds cliche but like turbidity even was a, a thing for me that before this winter I never thought I'd enjoy swimming in water where I couldn't at least see the end of my hand while I'm swimming and now we swim in water where I can't see my shoulders <laughs> um so just like these these limits that I thought were like kind of hard limits that now are things that I'm really comfortable with um, is, is something that I've learned about myself. And then also, I just want to add that like in this year where most of my friendships have become a lot more distant, it's really just special to have a group of friends where our friendship has actually grown. So. That's great. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to say connection is really big, both with these three people and how diverse we all are and all the different things we do and different walks of life we do, but also with our little spot where we swim and with my personal body as well, learning what I'm capable of and what I can do and how amazing it is that these women are also swimming without wetsuits too. <laughs> how it is it is possible if I just keep putting myself to the exposure and trying and putting it harder and that connection and just doing it more. Pete. Oh, wow. Have I learned anything about myself? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I would just reflect on what Cindy said. I think most of us, uh, most of the things we do in our lives, our roles are mediated through something that already exists. Like when I'm a professor, I do a certain thing. Um, and there's already a pre-existing structure for it, and you're sort of operating within that. Sort of one nice thing about this period of time in this group is it's very organically, like we all just happen to be in this place. We all, and, and it wasn't the first time we swam together, like let's continue to do this forever. Um, right. And who knows, this could be the last week, but it probably won't be. <laughs> um, I think just my appreciation of, um, of human interaction as people have said, but just as, as myself and not worrying too much about the larger context or like what it means, how it plays into everything else. It's just like, it's been a really nice rhythm 
and to recognize that like that there's I mean the thing about swimming unlike running or riding or anything else you do like you can't easily stop um, and I think in a time for me that when there's a million things going on in my mind all the time that responsibilities and concerns um, anxieties that was swimming is sort of is the one time when I knew what I was supposed to be doing which was to continue to swim uh, this is like it's nice to have that kind of focus for an hour every day or so um, so yeah Pete, Pete's ready he, he's ready to be a marathon swimmer that's all you got to do is just <laughs> swim you just need a little more time I love it <laughs> Thank can, you guys can I so say much. one more thing, Yeah, Janet? of course. You know, in the past, I've always either included people on my journey or helped lead them on their journey. And I feel like this group right now, I feel like I'm just a, a companion on everybody's journey. Like, I, I just feel like it's our journey and we yeah. have no idea the end point. You know, like on a yeah. big swim, you know, like it's going to happen on this day and then mm. you're going to process afterwards. Like we don't know that. So it's this like endurance event with no endpoint. And that's um it's a pretty, pretty intense, powerful thing to be to be partnering with them on. So I I really I've enjoyed our time and I've I've relied on it completely to to survive. So it's good. It is a marathon swim. We've swum hundreds and hundreds of miles. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's true when I conceptualize it in my mind, I don't think of it as I'm swimming. I think of it as like, there's this group of, of us and we, we swim together. Um, mm -hmm. So that's true. I love it. I love the connection you guys have been able to build. I'm glad that you have that for each other. Keep, keep marathoning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank right. you for your time today. Have a good one. All right. Thank Talk you. To you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Do you want to take Marathon Swim Stories with you? Subscribe on your favorite podcast provider. Want to connect with like-minded limit pushers? Join us for Marathon Swim Stories Live on Tuesdays at 5.30 a.m. Pacific, 8.30 Eastern, 13.30 GMT. Thanks for watching.